The scripture for today comes from Micah, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. People will stream to it, and many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us about his ways so that we may walk in his paths. For instruction will go out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will settle disputes among many peoples and provide arbitration for strong nations that are far away. They will beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not take up the sword against nation and they will never again train for war. For each person will sit under his grapevine and under his fig tree with no one to frighten him. For the mouth of the Lord of armies has spoken. Though all the peoples, yeah, though all the peoples each walk in the name of their gods, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. I am fascinated by the ways that American politicians use and sometimes abuse scripture. Some of this is because of the line of work that I'm in. I talk for a living, and so I'm fascinated by all forms of rhetoric. If someone's speaking in public, there's a good chance I'm interested, not necessarily in the content, but the craft, like how are they going about trying to communicate their message? And I talk about scripture for a living. So when other people from outside the domain of the church are talking about scripture publicly, I'm really, really curious. How are they using scripture? What purpose? Uh, how do they read it? Which version? What does it mean about their lives? Really, really fascinating. And I'm someone who has overall a pretty dim view of politicians. Like, I think that the way that we go about obtaining and wielding political power in this country and then one, what we do with it once we have it, I think it so often runs contrary to the ways of Jesus. But so many of our elected officials and people aspiring to become elected officials identify as Christian. Every president in my lifetime has identified as a Christian. We've had people from the United Church of Christ and Methodists. We've had Presbyterians and Catholics and Evangelicals. I'm fascinated by the ways that they use scripture. Woodrow Wilson, when he was still governor of New Jersey before he became president, he claimed that the Bible is undoubtedly the book that has made democracy and been the source of all progress. Now, I would maybe want to quibble with him a little bit, but it's clear he, at least in public, was trying to hold scripture in very high regard. And many other presidents have done the same, sprinkling scriptural allusions and quotations into their speeches. Lincoln was pretty famous for this. Lincoln referred to scripture a lot. He appropriated it, he quoted it, he misquoted it. Uh, sometimes he just alluded to it. When he was reflecting on the horrors of the Civil War, he quoted from the 19th Psalm. And he affirmed that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And in his view, the entire enterprise of the Civil War was one of these judgments of the Lord. Or Ronald Reagan. Reagan would quote Jesus sometimes. He cited Luke 14, and he would say, Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel, whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? And the reason Reagan quoted this was in defense of his proposed national budget that included a massive increase in military spending, including on nuclear weapons. And he quoted Jesus to support it, which feels very strange to me. Well, Barack Obama, who spoke at a memorial service for the victims of the Newtown school shooting, he drew from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Scripture tells us, Obama says, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And Obama's successor drew from that very same book of the Bible, 2 Corinthians, uh, in a quote and during a speech that he made to a Christian university where he said, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's the whole ballgame, he said. This is a trend that goes all the way back to the founding. American politicians and leaders quoting scripture for their own purposes. In fact, it's probably decreased in prevalence. If you go back to the founding era, there were more scriptural references and allusions and quotations and citations. 
Washington used a lot of scripture in his speeches and in his writings. And his most frequent scriptural reference, one that he used almost four dozen times throughout his life, at least in the publicly available records, came from this passage that we just heard read for us by TJ. That everyone shall sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If you get your uh, historical education from Broadway and you've seen Hamilton, you could be forgiven for thinking that Lincoln actually, sorry, that Washington actually quoted this in his farewell address. He did not. Uh, but he did quote it nearly four dozen times, often in letters and personal correspondence. Uh, this is one example. He's writing to his friend after the end of the Revolutionary War. He's writing to his friend and colleague, the Marquis de Lafayette, and he says this. He says, at length, my dear Marquis, I am become a private citizen on the banks of the Potomac, and under the shadow of my own vine and my own fig tree, free from the bustle of a camp and the busy scenes of public life, I am solacing myself with those tranquil enjoyments of which some people can have very little conception. Washington often used this language of vine and fig tree to refer to his estate at Mount Vernon, and as he found himself sitting there after having commanded the revolutionary forces to a successful military victory over the British Empire, he reflected on sitting under his own vine and his own fig tree, the tranquil pleasures, enjoyments that some can have no conception of. And then he names some of those people who can have no conception of the pleasure, the privilege to sit under his own vine and his own fig tree. He says, the soldier who is ever in pursuit of fame or the statesman, or what we today would call the politician, whose watchful days and sleepless nights are spent in devising schemes to promote the welfare of his own country, or perhaps the ruin of other countries, as if this globe was insufficient for us all. Or the courtier, who is always watching the countenance of his prince in hopes of catching a gracious smile. Any of these, the soldier, the politician, the courtier, can have very little conception of the tranquility and the pleasure of sitting under your own vine and your own fig tree in contentment. Again, I have a pretty dim view of politicians and of the political process, but I think that maybe in this instance, George Washington was onto something. That he recognized something about the way God has ordered and shaped and structured existence. That there is this enjoyment that can come from an experience of contentment, and satisfaction, where you sit under your own vine and your own fig tree, where no one makes you afraid. God seems to have built this into the very structure and fabric of existence itself, but it is so easy, so very, very easy for us to miss out on it. We're engaged, when we're engaged in the pursuit of fame or the practice of violence like the soldier, we don't think much about what it would be like to sit under our own vine and our own fig tree. Or when, when we're concerned about national advancement or personal advancement, striving for greater status and standing, greater fame or greater fortune, we don't think about the pleasures of sitting under our own vine and our own fig tree. We miss something significant and profound because we are so caught up in the hustle and the bustle of life and self-aggrandizement, we miss something profound about how meaningful it could be if each and every person, starting with ourselves, simply had enough. To sit under our own vine, our own fig tree, to be in a space where no one makes us afraid. Now, Washington didn't fully live into this vision. About five years after he penned this letter to the Marquis de Lafayette, he would find himself being inaugurated as the first president of the United States of America. Maybe this is part of my dim view of politicians. I have a hard time trusting people when I don't know if they're really being truthful or not. But even though he may have missed out on a little bit, I think there can be something profound and meaningful for us contained in this vision of the future. If you want to use a fancy term, you could call this an eschatological vision, a vision of what it looks like when God sets everything right in the world. And what it looks like is an opportunity for each and every person to sit under their own vine and their own fig tree. So I want to test with us this morning three hypotheses about what it might look like to orient our lives, to move toward this vision 
what seems to be God's preferred vision of the future, to move ourselves toward experiencing personally, communally, and then sharing with others what would it look like, what would be involved, what is the path forward toward everyone sitting under their own vine and their own fig tree. And the first two hypotheses are set in the negative, things that I think we can't do if this is our preferred vision, things that are off limits to us. And then the final hypothesis is a positive one, something that I believe we can do to find ourselves moving in this direction. So the first negation, the first hypothesis is this. I do not believe that we can steal our way to prosperity. Note that the vision of the prophet is that everyone sits under their own vine and fig tree. It is not everyone taking their neighbor's vine and fig tree. It is not everyone going out and trying to accumulate more that does not belong to them so that they have more vines and more fig trees. It is everyone sitting under their own vine or fig tree. We cannot steal our way to this vision of prosperity. Again, I'm not convinced Washington ever fully learned this lesson. The vines and the fig trees that he sat under were planted by hands that were not his own and were not compensated for their work. Washington remained a slaveholder for his entire earthly life. It is true that he made the, the right and proper decision to emancipate his slaves upon his death, but during his lifetime, he benefited from the stolen labor of others. And so there's something a little bit disingenuous in his claim to be sitting under his own vine and his own fig tree. It is a vine and fig tree that rightfully belongs to someone else. We cannot steal our way to prosperity. Maybe this is why Scripture is so concerned with covetousness or wanting what others have that we don't have. Maybe this is why so many of the commandments that God gives to the children of Israel warn against coveting things that belong to your neighbor's. Maybe this is why James, the brother of Jesus, will warn later on in James 4, he'll say, where, where does strife come from among you? Doesn't it come from the fact that you want and don't have, and so you covet, and then you try to take? We do profound damage to the fabric of existence that God desires for us to experience for our good and for God's glory. We do profound damage when we are trying to take what belongs to others. Now, there are some counterexamples of this in Scripture. We hear a lament in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that it does seem, at least for a time, that the wicked prosper, that some people do seem to be able to successfully steal their way into prosperity, taking that which is not theirs and trying to benefit from it. Or you have the very glaring example of Deuteronomy when the children of Israel are entering into God's promised land and God seems to promise them that they will benefit from crops they did not plant and live in houses they did not build. And so you find these counterexamples there. But I think even there, even when you read the story of the children of Israel coming into this promised land, the way they go into it does not actually set them up, up for a long-term experience of peace and tranquility and prosperity for generations. They go in and they try to benefit from land that is not theirs, from crops they didn't plant, from houses they didn't build, and it does not go well for them. If God's vision is that everyone has this experience of peace and tranquility and sufficiency and even prosperity, it cannot come by trying to expropriate what others have. We cannot steal our way to prosperity. The second hypothesis, the second negation that I would offer is that we cannot fight our way to peace. There's this myth that's pretty pervasive in a lot of human thinking that peace is something that exists on the other side of conflict. And so the path to peace is through conflict. We have to go through the conflict, and then when we win the conflict, then we get to a space of peace. But it doesn't actually work that way. Peace is not just a destination. Peace is a path, a means. It is not just an end. Peace is something we have to practice if we want to experience it. Maybe this is why in this vision of sufficiency and tranquility that the prophet Micah offers that was so resonant for George Washington, maybe this is why this prophet says this, God will judge between many peoples and arbitrate between strong nations far away. And as God does this, these strong nations shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But 
Once this has happened, once they have embraced peace, not as something that exists on the other end of conflict, but as something that they can experience and practice here and now, then, then they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. Because the reality is that violent conflict does great damage to vines and fig trees. It harms everything about existence. It makes human life more difficult. We've talked a little bit in a few weeks ago about some of the damage that happens in, in Palestine to olive crops, right? Trees that take years, if not decades, to be tended to before they finally bring forth a harvest are burned down in the midst of conflict. The same is happening in Ukraine right now. Formerly arable land, land that could be fruitful, that could bring forth food, that provides sustenance for human beings. This land that had been farmland is now a minefield. It's covered with unexploded ordnance. The fertile soil layer, that delicate topsoil that has such rich, important nutrients for feeding human beings, it's torn up by tank treads or artillery or missiles that land in the wrong place. Things don't grow anymore. One economist put the estimate fairly early on in the conflict at over $4 billion just to the agricultural sector of Ukraine. They said there's probably been deaths of over 40,000 sheep or goats, over 90,000 cattle, over a quarter of a million pigs killed in the conflict. There is no way that you move toward everyone experiencing the bounty and the peace of their own vine and their own fig tree if we're constantly uprooting them in the midst of our conflicts. We cannot fight our way to peace. And so if you find something in yourself that resonates with this vision, what a beautiful vision of the world and of society it would be when people can get along harmoniously, when they are content with what they have, when each has a vine for shelter and a fig tree to provide sustenance, when the basic needs of all human beings are met. If you find yourself resonating with this vision, then know that we can't get there by theft or expropriation taking what isn't ours, and we can't get there by violence or force. So here's the third hypothesis, and I'm, I'm bold enough to say I think this actually moves from the realm of hypothesis to establish fact. If you disagree with me, then we can have that conversation. That's fair. But I think it's a pretty basic fact. Vines and trees grow from seeds. This vision of what God desires for humanity this vision of what it looks like when all is made right and whole in the world, when there's shalom, when there's peace, when nothing is missing and nothing is broken, this is something that has to grow from the ground up. You can't take it. You can't fight to acquire it. It has to grow from the ground up. Or in other words, there are no shortcuts. This preferred vision of the future that the prophet Micah holds forth for the people of Israel, that George Washington appropriated for himself, that we ourselves can lean into, there are no shortcuts to get there. And maybe it's no wonder that the fruit of the Spirit includes patience. We're going to be starting a series in a couple of weeks, spending nine weeks looking at each of the fruit of the Spirit described for us in the book of Galatians, and one of them is patience. I think we heard this morning that we have some impatient people in our congregation who like to get things done quick, and now I would count myself in that category. But the fruit of the Spirit is patience. The work of God takes time. If you want to sit under your own vine and have your own fig tree, someone somewhere had to plant those seeds in the ground, cultivate them, tend them, give them the time to grow, protect them in their infancy. It takes time to move into God's preferred future. There are no shortcuts. You can't steal your way to prosperity. You can't fight your way to peace. You have to do the work here and now, work that might not necessarily bear fruit for weeks or months or years, or in some cases, generations. There's a Roman Catholic leader in the 1800s by the name of Father Hyacinth. He had a bit of a rough go with some of the uh, established hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Perhaps the only thing worse than the American political process is church political processes. <laughs> he had a rough go, ended up being excommunicated, but he was a famous orator in France during his day before he ended up moving to New York after the excommunication. And he preached these long, winding, discursive sermons about things of great importance. People would flock to Notre Dame to hear him speak. 
And he has this very long treatise that he actually presented orally on the family. And he reflects on the role of the family within society and within the church and has such a high view of what families are. And he, spends, uh, he goes to a great lengths to talk about farmers as people within the family. So much of the community of the day would have been engaged in agriculture. And this is what Father Hyacinth says. He says that for what he calls the, the husband, he loves the earth then, both for her own sake and for her fruits. He loves the fields for themselves and for the splendor of the golden harvest which covers them in summer. He loves the vines for the abundant and fruitful branches of autumn and for the new wine which rejoices the heart of man. Then he says this, these trees which he plants and under whose shade he shall never sit, he loves them for themselves and for the sake of his children and his children's children who are to sit beneath the shadow of their spreading boughs. And this has become something of an aphorism or a proverb in our culture today, that there is a blessing in planting a tree under whose shade you will never sit. And it's somewhat counterintuitive if our life is focused on ourselves and what we can get and what we can acquire and what we can hold on to and the name we can make for ourselves. It's somewhat counterintuitive to say that some of our most important work will not actually benefit us It will benefit someone a decade from now, or a generation from now, or a hundred years from now. And I think this is part of what the prophet Micah is hinting at. That if we envision a future where everyone can sit under their own vine, under their own fig tree, then maybe the most important thing we can do right now is to plant some vines, to plant some fig trees. It's not just about whether I get to sit under my own vine and my own fig tree, but whether we all, collectively, those who share this moment in time with me and those who will come after me, whether we all, collectively, get to move into God's preferred future, a space of peace and tranquility, of sufficiency or even prosperity, not because I get to experience it now, because I get to take it right now, but because I do the difficult work of planting these seeds so that they can grow and flourish for for my children and my children's children and for your children and your children's children and for the children of people we may never meet. This is the life that God has called us to. Vines and trees grow from seeds. We're in this season of back to school like can't talk about it too much because some people in my household will get upset with me. But it is an opportunity, I think, to think about how we are investing into the future, how we are planting seeds, uh, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others who will come after us. To think about how we're caring for the children who are present within this congregation. To think about how we're tending to the creation that all of us need to inhabit. Are we leaving a legacy for the future? Think about the financial investments that we make, the investments of time and relationship. There are all of these opportunities that we have to plant seeds. Because we know that this vision of Micah remains unfulfilled. If this is God's preferred future, we haven't gotten there yet. We still have swords when we should have plow shares. We still have spears when we should have pruning hooks. Some people have an awful lot of vines and an awful lot of fig trees, and some people bake in the sun and don't have enough to eat. But if this is God's preferred future, each and every day we have opportunities to invest, to put something into the ground knowing we might not reap the benefits, but someone else might. All of our actions can move us closer to what God desires. So that in the days to come, people can stream to the mountain of the Lord and say, let us go up to the mountain that God may teach us God's ways and that we may walk in God's paths. So that God can judge between many peoples and arbitrate between strong nations. So that in this space of peace, we can beat our swords into plowshares, our spears into pruning hooks. So that we don't need to lift up sword against nation anymore. We don't even need to learn war because everyone can sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree. There's another phrase that's become popular in recent years. I tried to track down the source, but it's one of those things where someone said it once and attributed it to someone else who probably never really said it. But it goes something like this, that the best time to plant a tree 
was 30 years ago. But the next best time is today. And so I invite you to consider as you think about your life and the opportunities that exist in front of you, how are you making investments into this future, God's preferred future, where no one is afraid, where nothing is missing, where nothing is broken, where everyone has enough. Let's pray together. Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks for this amazing vision that you gave to your prophet Micah that resonates and echoes throughout millennia to our ears. And we know that this vision has yet to be fulfilled, but we hold forth the hope that in your strength and your power, you will do it. Yet we know that you prefer to act with us, not always over us. So I pray, God, that you would soften the soil of our own hearts as we think about how we invest seeds into the future, the future where everyone can live under their own vine and their own fig tree, and no one will be made afraid. Let me pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.